Amen. Thank you for that, Brother Zane. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. And we're going to read just one verse together this morning. A little bit different message this morning, but it's along our series of Hope for the Home that we're in this summer. And uh, really the title is Four Railings of Hope for the Home. And uh, it comes from Deuteronomy 22. And I want to stand, if you're able to, right off the bat. Let's all stand together and we'll read that one verse together, Deuteronomy 22 and verse 8. Nathan, a little bit of echo up here on the platform. If you can dial that in, that would be helpful. And we'll read Deuteronomy 22 and verse 8 and then we'll all be seated uh, together and I'll give a little bit of introduction for the message today. But let's read beginning in verse number 8. Ready? When thou buildest a new house... Then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house, if any man fall from thence. And you can be seated there. The houses in Israel and all over the east, really, of that day had flat roofs. And these roofs were a very important part of their family life. They served a very important purpose to uh, their uh, just daily living. And uh, oftentimes it served as just extra living space. They would get out on the roof uh, and it'd be a little cooler. The wind would be blowing. They would eat. They would uh, fellowship there. A flat roof was used as workspace oftentimes, even storage space. And uh, it was that way. Uh, remember when Rahab hid the spies in the promised land on a roof of this kind. In fact, in Joshua chapter 2 and verse number 6, the Bible says, But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. Down in verse number 8, And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And so uh, these roofs were so important. A lot of activity went on these roofs. It was a place where they could go and walk and relax or walk and pray. If you remember, uh, David uh, was out walking on the roof of the palace when he uh, looked over and saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof of her house and his uh, being the palace was higher and the angle such that set in motion that entire uh, regrettable chain of events. But uh, because the roof was used so much in the life of the Israelites, God gave them very clear instruction and very clear safeguards to make sure that no one was hurt or injured because of being on the roof. Now, in their case, it was almost strictly in the physical realm, and the physical nature. He said, you'll need to put short walls or battlements around your roof to protect whoever might be on it from falling off or from getting injured or even ultimately dying. And so these battlements, these short walls, would cause someone to have to purposely uh, climb over them, purposely ignore the safety that they provided. And, and so that was the law of the land for the children of Israel. Notice in verse 8, uh, the Bible says, and that uh, back up in Deuteronomy 22, he said that uh, when thou buildest that new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house if any man fall from thence. And what the Lord was saying there was there had to be those four walls, one for each side, so that if someone did fall, the responsibility would not be on the owner of the house. He would have no liability, just like we would want to make sure on our property here, or on your personal uh, home, that there was nothing dangerous. There was nothing, uh, a situation that would cause harm to anyone. And one thing to always remember about God is He is a God of personal responsibility and personal accountability. He made it very clear, the homeowner, it is your responsibility to make sure these safeguards are in place. It's your job uh, to make sure no one is hurt or injured uh, off of your roof. And he was very clear that if you did not have these walls and someone did fall and die, then the avenger of blood could come after you. And the avenger of blood was simply the family of the person 
that was injured because of your liability, uh, they had every right to come and take their vengeance. And so uh, the Lord really was saying, hey, I'm giving you these safeguards. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, your house is safe. And, uh, and this morning, I want to give us four battlements to protect our homes in this day. And so keep your Bibles out. We're going to look at a lot of Scripture this morning. Amen. I say often uh, from this pulpit that for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it's a wonderful thing that He loves all of the world. But even better than that is the fact that He loves you and I individually and and uh, if we were the only one on the face of the earth, I believe this with all of my heart, uh, he still would have sent his son to die on the cross. And so we are that one earthly reason that the Lord Jesus went to Calvary. Well, this morning, I want to give us those four walls of safety, those four railings, those four battlements or bulwarks to protect our homes. These create safety and security and stability and provide hope uh, for the relationships in our home. And the first wall that I want to give us this morning is the battlement of trust in the home. The battlement of trust. In fact, turn in your Bibles. We're going to turn several places in Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3 if you will, and we'll look at that, and then we're going to go to Proverbs 31. But one of the basic building blocks in every single relationship that we have in this life is trust. Without trust, there really cannot be much of a relationship, and a husband and a wife must trust each other if their relationship is going to flourish. In fact, we need to establish a family culture of faith and trust, and our trust should be first and foremost in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6. He says there, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And so uh, we should establish a home dynamic where we trust the Lord. And we trust His Word to guide us and to be our final authority in every area of life. Uh, we ought to be a family that walks by faith and not by sight. But then we must also establish a culture of trust in each other in our homes. A suspicion in a marriage or suspicion in any relationship is a poisonous seed that the devil plants to destroy. It's a cancer that erodes the health of our relationships. And sometimes we have to admit our own actions or our own inactions can cause those seeds of suspicion uh, to come. But I, I love what the Bible says about the Proverbs 31 uh, woman and their family dynamic. Look at Proverbs 31 and look at verse 11. And of course, this, this chapter is specifically about the Christian wife. Uh, we're not saying by any means that it doesn't go both ways. Obviously, it goes both ways. But look what it said in verse 11. The Bible says, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. That's a healthy dynamic for a healthy marriage. Look what he said, So that he shall have no need of spoil. He doesn't need plan B. He doesn't need to protect himself with, with extra money laid up just in case because he trusts uh, his wife. Look at verse 12. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. And certainly, again, that ought to be uh, both ways. But what I want you to see in verse 11 is the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. See, trust is a matter of the heart. Matter of fact, we just read in Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And so when you truly trust someone, it is a matter of the guards coming down off of our heart, the protection coming off of our heart, and we place our trust in that person. That's why when our trust is betrayed, it's so damaging. 
because we've made our hearts vulnerable. And that's why it's so hurtful, because it pierces the very heart uh, when our trust is betrayed. That's why people who've been betrayed have such a hard time trusting again. Because we build up protection around our hearts so that we won't feel that pain and so that we won't feel that hurt again. But we must, we must be willing to trust the Lord and to trust others again. Then notice he also said he doth safely trust in her. I love that because there is safety, there is, there is comfort uh, when uh, you can trust someone and you can just let your guard down and you can know that my husband or my wife, whatever the case may be, I can trust them with every fiber of my being. I don't have to, to have that guard up. And, uh, and what an important thing uh, that is, to know that the person you trust will only seek your good. Look at that. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. They'll always have your back. And what an important thing that is. But here's the thing about trust. Uh, it takes time to build. That's what's so important about uh, the, the, the time before a young couple gets married, that it's not spent uh, in the physical side of the relationship, that it's spent on getting to know one another and really talking about, uh, about the future and getting to know each other because trust needs to be built up. And by the way, what takes a lifetime to build can be destroyed in the matter of a second or one careless moment. And so what I want to say to each of us on this point, and then we're going to move uh, to another point, is this, both husbands and wives, and even children in the home, and even parents in the home, let's work on our own lives and let's make ourselves someone that's able to be trusted. Let's make ourselves of the character of this woman that we read about in Proverbs 31 where her husband could safely trust in her. And he knew she would never do him harm all the days of their life. Let's make ourselves uh, worthy of that kind of trust. Let's, uh, that means that uh, we're honest. That means that we keep our word. That means that we live life with integrity. Teenager, work at living a life that is worthy of your parents uh, trusting you and placing their trust in you. Uh, we're for the third time in our life, in our married life, in our parenting life, uh, we're teaching one of our children how to drive. Amen? And Daniel always loves, of all of our kids, he always loves when he's the, the illustration of one of his uh, dad's, uh, in one of his dad's messages. But uh, we're teaching him to drive. And we'll go through months of, of teaching and process. of, uh, And when we're done, we'll turn loose another teen driver on Mobile and Theodore. Amen? And we'll let you know the exact date that happens just so you can make uh, preparations. But I tell you, the whole process is one about trust. It's one about building trust. From the very moment you step behind the wheel of the car for the first time with a new driver and, and you're, you're learning and he's learning and, and it's a process of building up trust with each of our prior two that uh, when it came time for them to begin to drive and begin to go out on their own, uh, there was a very tight, parameter uh, in place. There was very stringent uh, rules and where they could go, where they couldn't go, what they could do while they were going there, what time they had to be back. And, and they understood this is a process of building trust. And as they proved, as they showed that they could be trusted with that amount of responsibility, it increased and they got to that circle of, uh, of parameter began to grow. And uh, by the way, th that's why we need to work at being worthy of someone placing their trust in us because it's at the foundation of healthy relationships. I, I like this. That's why it's so easy for you and I to trust the Lord, because He proves Himself to us over and over and over again. He's never let us down, ever, and so it's easy to trust Him. In fact, take your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
And we see Paul reminding Timothy and really testifying to Timothy about the trust that he has placed in his heavenly Father. I love this verse, verse number 12. Paul said, for the which cause, talking about the ministry, talking about the cause of Christ, uh, church planning, the preaching that Paul did with his life, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. And by the way, Paul did suffer. Paul was uh, sitting in prison right now. Paul had been beaten and abused and betrayed and Paul had suffered. But he said, through all of that, I'm not ashamed. Look what he said, for I know whom I have believed. What a wonderful thing. He said, I know who I'm placing my trust in. I know his character. I know his history. I know how he's treated me. He said, I know whom I have placed, whom I have believed and in whom I have placed my trust. Then he said, not only that, but I am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. And here we see Paul at the end of his ministry about to be beheaded for the cause of Christ. And as he looks back over his ministry life in a Roman jail, he says to Timothy, I would do it all over again. In fact, he said, in spite of the things I've suffered along the way, I know whom I have believed. And I want to say this, when it comes to trusting. It's always about the person we're trusting. It's always about their character. It's always about their integrity. It's always about their history. It's always about uh, are they worthy of me opening up my heart and letting down the guard and placing my trust in them. And uh, Paul said, I trust that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him. I trust him against that day. Let me give you the second battlement. The first is trust. And boy, I trust and hope that you will place that wall of trust on the edge of your home. And I pray that we'll work at having trusting, healthy relationships. I pray that we'll work at being the kind of person that can be trusted in a marriage, the kind of husband that can be trusted, the kind of wife that's worthy of that kind of trust. The second battlement on our wall is love. In fact, take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, on the screen, don't put that up yet. Go back to, go back to Ephesians 5. I'm going to give you a couple verses before, but I want you to be at 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, love must firmly be in place in our homes, connected to the wall of trust. Husbands are commanded in the Bible to love their wives. Ephesians 5.28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And you know, that's a command from God for husbands to love their wives. Uh, we're so wishy-washy with love in our day. We, we think it's only an emotion. Uh, we, I, I think Brother Bennett talked about this to the staff this week. We use terms like falling in love or falling out of love, just like we have no control over our love. But God in the Bible completely contradicts that. In fact, he commands husbands to love your wives uh, as your own body. And he that loveth his wife, the Bible says, loveth himself. Wives are told to love their husbands and their children. In, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 4, he says that they may teach the young women, that the older women might teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Children, we're told, are to honor their parents, and part of that is loving them. Uh, parents are told to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and there's love involved in that. But uh, when we get to 1 Corinthians 13, it really fleshes out what that looks like. It kind of shows us what love is on a daily basis inside the four walls of our home and in, inside the, the, the confines of our, our place of residence or our place of work or our place of ministry. Look at 1 Corinthians 13 and look at verse number 4. This is what love looks like. 
You say, preacher, okay, I want to love my wife. I, I want to love my husband. I want to love my kids. Well, this is what it looks like in the context of getting up in the morning and getting ready for the day and getting ready in the evening and cooking and eating together and be, being together. This is what it looks like. Look what he said. He said, charity, love, suffereth long. First of all, love is patient with each other. Husband and wives, uh, love, if you love one another, you'll be patient with one another. When we love our children, we'll be patient with our children. He goes on to say, and is kind. Love is kind. Kind words to one another. A kind actions to one another. And, and those things need to continue throughout our lives. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, does not push itself forward, is not puffed up. And so love is not full of pride. Love is not jealous. Uh, love, there's no uh, sibling rivalry in love. Boy, through the years we've tried, and we're a competitive family, but through the years we've tried to make sure that our children uh, were not hurtful in their, in their rivalry and their competition. We tried to make sure at the end of the day we love one another in that way. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly. Love seeketh not her own. Hey, when we love each other, we're not going to be selfish it's not just going to be about you or about me. It's going to be about us. Hey, what works best for our family? What's better for all of us? He says, is not easily provoked. Hey, love doesn't provoke, but is also not easily provoked. You know, sometimes we can be too touchy. Sometimes we can let our buttons get pushed too easily. And sometimes we know uh, in the one we're married to, we know where all those buttons are. Uh, but love uh, is not easily provoked. Uh, love thinketh no evil. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Hey, love inside of a home, inside of a Christian family is honest with one another. There's honesty, there's transparency, uh, there's no hidden agendas or hidden uh, sin or hidden things going on in the home. It's, it's rejoicing together in the truth. Love, verse 7, beareth all things. Love believeth all things. Love hopeth all things. I love that. Because love gives the benefit of the doubt. Hey, when something happens, when uh, something unusual happens in the home, uh, you give one another the benefit of the doubt and you work through that together. And then finally, love endureth all things and charity never faileth. You know, the best thing about love is it's resilient <laughs> love, I mean, we can get our feelings hurt, but love is resilient. Love can bounce back. Love can be rekindled. And so we must have love in our home. And then the third battlement is this. We need to have trust in one another. We need to have love and we need to operate within our homes toward one another in love, just like 1 Corinthians 13 gives us. But then thirdly, the third battlement is this. It is attitude. It is a great attitude about being involved in the local church. Some people have such terrible attitudes about their involvement in church and it filters down to their children and it's no wonder that the first chance their children have, they have no desire to be involved in a church. By the way, I like this. In fact, turn to Psalm 84 and verse 10. Children who love the Lord and who love in being involved in the church on their own when they're older come from homes where mom and dad had the same attitude. I caught myself early in ministry as an associate pastor and Andrew and Brianna were very small. And I caught myself just in, the, just in the busyness of life and ministry and the daily burdens that you carry just trying to live life. Uh, I, I caught myself saying things like, okay, kids, let's go. We have to go uh, make this visit. Or we have to go uh, to church. And uh, the Lord just convicted me just as clearly as if he would have spoken my name on one afternoon. He said, 
Randy, what in the world are you teaching these children? And I thought about that for a minute. Didn't have to think long because I knew what I was teaching them. And from then on, I made it a conscious decision. And Tanya and I talked about it intentionally. Uh, man, church was going to be the highlight of our week. Getting involved in ministry was going to be the most exciting thing that we did. And the whole attitude and the whole atmosphere had to change because they're soaking up the attitude from mom and dad. I, I love what the Bible says in Psalm 84 and verse 10. You have to love uh, you have to love the psalmist's attitude. Look what he said there. He said, for a day, one day in the courts is better than a thousand. He said, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, I want you to catch that. The psalmist said, I'd rather be at church for one day than to have a thousand days doing something else that's not related uh, to being at the house of God. That was his attitude. That was his outlook. He also said, I would rather be doing something at the church. He said, man, just give me a door to guard. Just give me a door to keep. Just, just give me a, a bulletin to hand out. He said, I'd rather be doing something down at the church house than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, you can't tell me that kind of enthusiasm from a parent doesn't pass down to the children. I know it does. I've seen it happen. I've watched it. I've watched those uh, families whose kids get grown and serve the Lord and are excited about the things of God and they come from that kind of a home atmosphere. His attitude about that. I see an enthusiasm about it. Then look at Psalm 122 and verse 1. Man, again, you got to love the attitude of the psalmist. You gotta love. And by the way, uh, not every Sunday is everything just gonna be great and rosy. Not always are you gonna feel the best. Not always are you gonna be in the same frame of mind, but there ought to be an enthusiasm that starts in your soul from the Holy Spirit of God that rises up uh, to your spirit and your attitude and enthusiasm about the things of God. Look at Psalm 122 and verse 1. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, he said, man, my heart leap leapt within me when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so I can see just an attitude of him enjoying being involved and engaged in the things of God. I see a pure joy in going to church that sticks with our kids. And by the way, they'll carry it with them too. I love to see a couple of our little ones uh, a couple of our little two-year-olds as they head to the nursery over here. And uh, man, they are engaged. Uh, you try to stop them to shake their hand. They don't even see you there because man, they're headed to the nursery. They're headed to one of the highlights of their week. That's where all their friends are. That's where they're going to hear the Bible stories. That's where they hear loving, uh, friendly, smiling teachers who they know love them. They may not understand it all, but that is the comfort and the environment that they sense and they love it. And that's unfortunately uh, what where moms and dads a lot of times go wrong. And it's not that you don't love the Lord. It's not that you don't love His church. It's but but you don't you don't create that environment. Too much griping going on. Uh, too much complaining going on. Too much getting around folks who don't love the Lord and don't love the church. And we let that, we let that get our spirit a little bit out of whack. And we need to realize the, the effect that that has on our families and on our children. And then we see the fourth railing. We had the wall of trust that we need to build. The wall of love that we need to build. The, law, the, law, the wall of a proper attitude and spirit about the Lord and about engagement in the house of God. And then lastly, we see the wall of a consistent, genuine Christianity, consistency in the home. Take your Bibles and turn one more spot to Psalm 101. Thankfully, the one thing God never asks us to do as parents is to be perfect. Amen? How many are thankful about that this morning? 
uh, because every one of us have failed on that uh, more times than we can count. Uh, There is a steep learning curve when it comes to successfully rearing children who love the Lord. In fact, I believe this, the firstborn child in every Christian home, uh, that's the guinea pig, amen? That's where we get all the mistakes out. That's where we get everything, all the kinks worked out, all the bugs worked out. By the time Brianna came along, we were like, you know what, we might finally be ready uh, for this. And so uh, we've certainly made our fair share of mistakes through these almost 30 years of raising our children, and they could tell you story after story, of which I will kindly ask them not to do at this time. Uh, But the one thing we have tried to do for over 34 years of being saved and 30 plus years of marriage, and now almost 30 years with children in our home, we've tried to be consistent, and we've tried to be genuine in our daily walk. Our Christianity, we've tried to make sure it was authentic. And what I mean by that is this, in that what our kids have seen in their mom and dad at church is the same thing they have seen lived out in front of them at home day after day, week after week, month after month, and even year after year. We've tried to have genuine Christianity in that what our children have heard their dad preach from behind the pulpit, they have seen me try to live at home. Again, not perfectly, but and by any means, but, but they certainly haven't grown up with a double standard where they hear one thing and see another thing, where they see one, one parent at church and one different parent at home. Again, more kids get bitter and disillusioned by seeing moms and dads who live that kind of lifestyle. They just can't quite, they they can't put it together. They can't comprehend all of that uh, than any other reason. And again, you have to appreciate the, the attitude and the approach of the psalmist. Look at Psalm 101 and look at verses 2 and 3. He said there, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Now, that word perfect does not mean sinless or without making mistakes. That's not what he's saying. In Matthew, where the Bible says, be ye therefore perfect, even as I am perfect. He's not expecting you and I to be perfect, but he wants us to be spiritually mature, spiritually consistent, spiritually genuine in our Christian life. And so look what he said, Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? Now look at this little phrase, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Look at verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. In fact, he said, there are those that in my life that would try to get me off track. There are those that would try to influence me in a negative way. And he said, man, I'm going to just discard that because I don't want anything to keep me from my goal. And I love that. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. And what that word perfect in this context means is with genuine consistency. He basically said, man, when I'm in my home, I'm going to try to be real and genuine and authentic in my Christian walk. But there's something powerful in walking within our homes with that kind of consistency and genuineness that appeals to the younger generation. And uh, and here's what I want to say, and we'll be done. The Jewish home needed all four battlements in place to be safe. Only three out of the four wouldn't have protected their home adequately. Somebody could have fallen off the the, the side of the house that did not have it, and there would have been liability. I imagine that every now and then, they would walk all the way around the rooftop just to test the integrity of the railing and of the wall. I imagine they would give it a good shake every now and then. I would imagine if they found that it needed some attention and that it needed some repair, that they would focus on that for a little bit and they would get it back up to speed. 
And by the way, you and I must do the same. We need to build that wall of trust in our relationships and, and make sure if we've found this morning that, you know, maybe that railing is a little uh, flimsy in our home and in our life. We need to work on building that wall of love in our homes like 1 Corinthians 13 shows us. And we need to pass on the joy and enthusiasm about being involved in our local church. And then we need to strive to live that that consistent, genuine, authentic life in front of them every day. Now, one thing I didn't say this morning is that that's always easy. Amen? It's not always easy. In fact, but the results of being negligent in our responsibilities is far worse has far greater consequences. When the Jewish family got lazy and didn't make sure their battlements were in place, and someone did get injured or die, it was too late then to go back in time. You couldn't go back in time and fix it then and make it right. And I want to lead us as a church to a life of saying, you know what, I'm glad that we did build that wall of trust in our home. And I sure am glad looking years down the road and looking back over a life lived for Christ and kids that are living for Christ and grandkids that love the Lord and are living for Christ. I sure am glad we built that wall of love in our home. And I'm sure glad we made sure that attitude of of involvement and enthusiasm. You know, one problem we've never had in our life of of almost 30 years of rearing three children, we've never had the problem of them not wanting to come to church or having to drag them or having to convince them or having to bribe them. And I think it's just an, it's just an attitude thing. It's just an environment thing. And then I want us to be glad that we lived a consistent, genuine life when it came to our homes and our families. Instead of one day saying, boy, it's too late now, but I sure wish I had done a little more. I sure wish I had been a little more aware. I sure wish I had been a little more on top of some things. I sure wish I'd have gone a little further in some of these areas. I'm glad I did is always better than I wish I had. Let's pray together.